Hi everybody, it's Martin from the Washboard Resonators and on this video you are going to learn how to write many kinds of blues songs. So thank you to Jeremy for suggesting this as an idea. Uh, what are we going to look at? We are going to figure out how to do a very simple 12 bar blues song. We're going to look at how you can just magic lyrics from thin air. Then we'll look at how to make that 12 bar blues song uh, more interesting with arrangements. And then once we've mastered that simple 12 bar, I have got so many things like different feel changes, key changes, tunings, different chord sequences, many ways. So you will have a massive toolbox of ideas to be able to write dozens of songs from. So in the Washboard Resonators, our thing is that we do 20s and 30s music, but we really write a lot of original music in that kind of genre. So, you know, we have a number of albums out, we sell a lot of tickets when we go around on tour, and we have some music registered with Universal Music Company uh, for their music library, kind of TV music services, and more on the way, actually. So, you know, we have experience of writing songs. I'm really excited to share this with you because I'll probably learn what I know. So let's get started. I've got a guitar tuned to regular tuning and just for ease, let's just go in the key of E because that's really simple. Now I don't know your level, but let's just assume you have some basic kind of skills. You understand an E, an A, a B7 in order to be able to play a straightforward 12 bar blues. So just to make sure that everybody watching this is covered, um, a 12 bar blues are 12 bars of music. There are four beats to a bar. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. And I'm gonna lay on the screen now how many bars of each chord there are so you can see that. So I'm going to just come up with a very simple kind of um, guitar pattern uh, like this. It's just that kind of feel. So if you're sitting down to write a song, there are lots of ways you can write it. You can of course start with the lyrics and then add the music. You can also start with the music and add the lyrics. So there are lots of ways to come up with melodies. Um, you can just sometimes play and ideas come how you, have, how you feel, if you have enough experience. If you, maybe you don't kind of have maybe the, 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 the knowledge of melody lines, then you know what you can, if, if you learn typical blues guitar patterns, you'll soon find that a lot of those patterns that have melodicism within them lend themselves to vocal lines. So let's just, as an example, if I'm playing this in, you can hear that melody. You see, so that was just came out the guitar part, just that fell out there. If you know a pentatonic scale, um, you could use that to come up with melodies. All those notes would work in many ways. Another way is to use chord tones. So if you just pick notes out of each time you change the chord, because the pentatonic scale, most of the time the notes work, um, but there are, when you change chord, one or two of the notes sometimes don't quite make as much sense. Now you just reject them if you're experimenting, or you use chord tones. So uh, you could sort of, that could be your melody line to sing on the E. Then when you go to the A, or the A7, uh, something like uh... then you go to the B chord so just using the chord shapes what sounds right I mean, I'm showing you very badly here, but 
you get the idea. You just experiment, feel, and eventually it all becomes very automatic. But the other way to come up with melodies is to do what every, pretty much every blues performer has ever done, which is you take earlier songs and you just listen to them and you kind of take that song, you absorb it and you write your own words, you adjust the melody and you basically take something and recast it and that has always happened through the history of blues. Um, if you want perfect um, evidence of that then um, listen to Robert Johnson's Kind Hearted Woman and then listen to Mean Mistreater by Leroy Carr and what you'll hear is it's the same song idea played on piano but the arrangement's the same. There's a bridge, like coda bridge section at the end. Um, even the vocal uh, little refrains, woo, all the little things in between are very similar. Um, is it stealing? Is it borrowing? It's, it's just part of the tradition and don't be afraid of that. So there we go. We can get some melodies out of this. Uh, let's look at lyrics now. <laughs> But before we look at lyrics, uh, you, this is where you can help us. So you know what? Uh, we're professional musicians, COVID's destroyed us. So, you know, supporters, go to the um, description below and the best thing to do is sign the mailing list. We've got records coming out, we've got gigs coming up eventually. We'd just love to, a few times a year, tell you what we're doing. Beyond that, you can uh, subscribe and press the bell icon. That actually helps this channel massively you can drop a comment below and just, just tell us what you had for your dinner because weirdly that, that allows our video to be seen by more people. And you can also um, press the like button or um, melt it with red hot molten love. That was for Casper. So in terms of lyrics on a typical 12 bar, a very standard thing that people do is what's called an AAB verse structure. What does that mean? So by AAB, we literally mean that, that um, line one represents a certain piece, a lyric, a certain piece of information. There, there are what we call two A's because we're basically saying that the second line is the exact same as the first line. And then when we say it's, there's a B, it means that the next line, the third line, is different from the first two lines, AAB. So what's an example of this AAB structure? Well, think about something like um, cr crossroads, okay? Um, I went down to the crossroads, fell down on my knees. Then it repeats, I went down to the crossroads, fell down on my knees. Ask the Lord above have mercy, save poor Bob if you please. So you find this kind of structure going back to the, um, the 19th, 18th, 17th, 16th century in a lot of British, European kind of ballad songs, not ballads like Whitney Houston, but the kind of folk tradition of telling stories. So you repeat the line so that the audience has heard and then there's a refrain. You also see this kind of structure a lot in hymnal songs as well. So the blues certainly was influenced by these uh, more like folk elements and it's passed through to these days. So how do you come up with lyrical content in a song? Well, you know, if you're genuinely having feelings about something, it's going to want to come up. So the, we're talking really there about being honest or having um, a certain kind of earnest kind of sense of yourself and putting that out there. The other way, of course, is that like uh, professional songwriters have always just written to a brief. So you could even say, I want to write a happy song today. Especially if you're learning to do this, you could just set yourself goals and tasks and hard things to write about. I'm going to write a comedy song. I'm going to write a song about, I don't know, putting the bins out or just something to sort of give yourself a hard time in coming up with this stuff. There's a great interview with uh, Big Bill Brunzi in I think 1953 with a guy Studs Terkel. I think you can find it, I think it was a radio show. Um, and he says, you know, how do you write songs? And big, bear in mind that Big Bill Brunzi uh, recorded first in 1925 and he did about 250 sides. He was a professional Chicago session guy and he was writing for people. And he basically says, let me get this right, he says, you know, you just, you could just literally pick something, you know, it could be like a knife or an axe or a woman. I mean, you know, a Freudian psychologist would probably have a field day with what he came up with. But you just come up with something, he said, then what you do, you think of five different th things you could do with that. And then you just put them into these A, A, B structures. And if you think of five things, that means you've got five verses. So it could be a knife, I'm going to go and stab her, and I'm going to go and chop something. I'm going to chop my own heart out. I'm going to um, 
throw it at the wall, I'm going to knife somebody's tires, I'm going to become a butcher. Am I revealing too much? Stop there. Right, so I'm going to try and literally, in real time here, come up with a song. So we're going to try and use what I've explained. We're going to try the AAB structure. I'm going to try and come up with a melody to that feel. Okay, here we go. I'm looking out the window. I can see a bird on the chimney. Well, I'm looking. That's singing. I'm looking out the window. There's a bird against the sky. Absolutely dog sheep, but you get the idea. You know, I've looked out the window and I've seen a bird and I've come up with some terrible verses off the cuff, but you get the idea. What you do is you write them down, and this is where I can share some really interesting things. I hope. So, what you do is you start to write them down, and you let's say to you know to fill say two and a half, three minutes, you need probably about five verses on a typical 12 bar. So you write five things about, in this case, say the bird, you know, the bird's flying away, you maybe put yourself in the idea, you know, this is where you get kind of poetic, you think, you know, do you align with the bird and do you want to fly with the bird? Do you see the bird as a threat? I don't want that bird up there. This is where you can get really kind of creative and, you know, you create that kind of idea of, of, of what that represents, you know. Um, I've got my Ted Hughes book somewhere around here, the, 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 the poetry of the crow. That is a crow, actually. All about this, this bird that is this, like, um, almost like a, a, a supernatural force of nature. And, uh, you know, straight away there, you think, well, you know, that's inspirational. You could share that into a song. Or not! It's your choice. So if you've got five verses, you've basically got a song. Now, let's just now look at the lyric situation. So here I have... Um, the Washboard Resonator songs and you know do check out our music on Spotify or there's a playlist I'll pop a link below of um, like original material that's ours you know there's some blues stuff in there and folk influence stuff but yeah um you know I will write the song and write a song sheet but sometimes when you're writing songs and you're trying to get the the verse structure to have the same words like like I missed, messed up in that last one I used different um kind of phrasing so one of the ways to make sure that your verses always have the same melody line and have the same verse structure is this. What I'll do is I will um, maybe come up with a verse idea and a melody and then I'll write a verse and I'll like the verse. And then as I start to write the second verse, I start to kind of struggle with lyrically with where to put the words and I'll start adding extra syllables and you kind of get confused. So what I learned to do a long time ago was to basically, I'll write the first verse out and then what I do is I pop lines down the page this is just on a scrap piece of paper on the back of the lyric sheet and then what i do then is for the verse two verse three verse four whatever i will just write words that fit in these columns and what it does is it, it just forces me to be um strict about making sure that the uh, the rhyming pattern or the stresses are all in the same place so doing that helps. Another thing which I learned from John Cleese, which was interesting, John Cleese has a great video about uh, creativity and he talks about, it's, it, it's like a talk from the 1980s, but he talks about how to be creative and he kind of basically says like, you know, what you should probably do is do no more than an hour and a half. You say, I'm going to create playtime. I'm not going to mess with anything. I'm going to tell, you know, nowadays you turn your phone off. For about an hour and a half, I'm going to play. And that might literally be playing a guitar with a sheet of paper. You're playing. It's almost like Lego. I'm just playing with words and sounds. I'm literally playing. His idea was that after an hour and a half, you're gonna probably 
stop getting good stuff. So that's the time to go and do something else. That's when you go and do your email, that's when you go and vacuum, you do something practical. And then perhaps you come back to it later. So what you do is you keep working the songs. And basically what I do is I go through a drafting system. So what I will do is I will rough you in those words out. I'll do the columns like I explained. Then what I'll do is I'll write a finished song with a, a structure and I'll play it through to myself. And then do you know what? I, there's often lines. In order to get a rhyme, you'll put a line down and you won't like the line. It won't feel good to you. But what you'll do and this is what he says, uh, John uh, says in this, um, this talk. He says, what he finds, you leave it for a few days. You, you put that piece of work aside for a few days. You walk away, you do other stuff and, and, the, and you come back to it. And when you come back to it, instantly you look at it and you can see all the things that you weren't happy with before, but you were probably too exhausted or too embroiled in it to deal with. He says, you just walk away, a few day, two, one, two, three days, four days, you come back and you'll be able to fix it quickly. And I think this is so true for me. So just one more trick, which I think will help you, and it's really helped me and saved me a lot of time over the years. I learned a long time ago, uh, when I was about 20, so 20 years ago, I figured out that writing lyrics from a title speeds up the process. That might sound odd, um, but yeah, if you just think of a title Often the title of a song is the refrain, the, the bit that people are meant to sing along to. It embodies the song. So if you think of a song like Kind Hearted Woman or um, Crossroads Blues, I'm thinking of Robert Johnson now, or Key to the Highway. Just if you came up with that phrase, instantly it's so full of suggestive ideas about what the song's about. Crossroads, I'm at Crossroads, I don't know, you know, I'm, it could go either way. So there's a whole world of emotion you could play with there. Kind Hearted Woman. Um, you know, it's a lovely woman. Have you been bad to her? Is she been good to you? So a great thing to try and do is to come up with a title, come up with a, a phrase, uh, something that's almost like it could be chanted. And then what you do then is you then do like a free association thing and work back from that. Okay, so to recap, we have looked at how you um, have a basic 12 bar, how you come up with melodies and different techniques come up with melodies. We've also looked at then ways to come up with lyrics, a simple format for lyrics. We've also looked at techniques to help get your rhyming structure, your syntax in place. We've also looked at ways to simplify the process, whether it's creatively, having time, drafting, and then also working from a title. We also have given you basically a very simple idea. So we've now said, you know, from my idea, you can have a simple song, which is basically, there's no arrangement to it. You could come up with five verses to that very simple pattern. You technically have a song there. Is it any good? You know what? A lot of the old blues guys that I like, like Sunhouse or Robert Johnson, a lot of their songs don't really have much arrangement. Usually there's a guitar part. And basically the song starts with that as a kind of instrumental, they sing verses and then very rarely there are guitar breaks on the recordings, maybe live they would have been in, back in the day, and then the song finishes and that's kind of it and that's great, that's, that's a song, brilliant. But there are so many ways that you can make a song interesting, so let's now share some of those. So what we're really talking about are arrangements and you know there's so many ways that you can arrange. So straight away, if we've got that very simple pattern and we're singing So we've got kind of a verse pattern, you could sing maybe two verses, then you could just do an instrumental. Now you could just play the same guitar part. You could come up with a slightly more interesting guitar part for those um, instrumental interludes between the verses, you know, so... Completely interesting bits. You know, you could kind of, it depends how, depends how good you are, but you could come up with some ideas. If you've got a band, then, you know, those instrumental passages are great if people take solos. You, you might have harmonica or violins or trumpets or all kinds of stuff. You know, you could lead guitars. You, that all is now making an arrangement. Instead of just being blocks of singing, 
with an instrumental backing, you're now, you know, still playing a 12 bar blues, but you are kind of making it more interesting to the listener because there are mood changes. Textures are a great way to do it. In the washboard resonators, Jack, who plays washboard, he studied at, um, in America college or in Britain university level, um, jazz drumming, but a big thing he did was um, pop music and arranging. And he has pointed out stuff that I never knew about even, you know, bands like Queen and stuff we listen to sometimes. And it's like fascinating how interesting their arrangements are. Textures is something he is fascinated by. And let's look at textures now. So, you know, we talk about that thing. So you could just be singing, I'll go to five. change the texture. So you can do it rhythmically. Do you hear how that's a different texture now? Straight away we're looking at the thing going from being kind of rolling to being choppy. That's what I meant to do. Um, you could do it in another way. thing but you see how that four so you're playing like a, a strong rhythmical pattern on every beat that walking feel one two three four that walking feel gives it a texture change a different feel and then you can go back to the you know at the end of that pattern uh, Things in between, when you stop singing, making it change between the singing. So a lot of blues music is based on like a question and answer kind of thing. You know, so so the A, A, B phrase uh, form, is, you know, is you ask a question, you ask it again, and then you answer. Well, do you know what? You can only do that on a, a micro level. You can do it in your solos, you know, if you're playing. So that's a, that's a question. an answer well think when you're thinking logically think like that but also in the song but don't so i'm going to sing and then answer on the guitar do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. you get you get the idea one more thing you could do is just look at like um your intro and your outro so you know you could do uh, if we're in e An intro helps, and then you know your outro. It's an ending, a very common ending in, in songwriting terms, and, and and a lot of jazz guys. You know, when I play with jazz guys, they kind of there's a lot of phrases that go around. You know, the forms. It's an A A B A in C sharp, it, or the chord sequences are six two five ones. Um, there's all these kind of phrases, but one phrase that gets thrown around a lot is when you get towards the end, the, the band leader will shout three tag. What that means is that at the end of a song, you'll have like the, the tagline, which is at the end of every verse structure. They do. Um, the birds flown away, I think. I'm going to have a cup of coffee. The birds flown away, I think. I'll have a cup of coffee. And the birds flown away, I think. was a three tag and it really it's something I do probably too much and Jack demolishes me for often if you're playing live gigs and it's like a noisy audience I have learned through bitter hard experience of doing 200 gigs a year for the last 10 years that um, with a noisy audience if you don't make it really obvious that the song's coming to a finish you kind of get to the end of the song and the birds flow finish to silence and it's awkward and it gets it's too late for people to start and then what you've happened is the three people that are like like what you're doing they're like okay it's good it's good but it kind of gets a bit awkward and if you're not careful you can go a bit sort of oh we'll just have a good gig tonight so you've really got to try and make it really obvious you know right especially at the end there you know that's a nice little tip for you but, you know kind of like uh, you know the three tag works 
but also, you know, make it really obvious and sharp, especially like... <laughs> set up that ending. So another idea to expand in terms of arrangement is how about, think of like the Beatles and think about the kind of, um, look at how their songs are structured often, like the 50s, 60s kind of pop music often kind of moves on from this kind of format. And a very regular thing to have in those kind of songs as a structure is you have an intro, you assume you have an intro, but you basically have verse, chorus, or verse, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, or middle eight, and then usually a double chorus at the end. Now let's think about our 12 bar, and let's think about having a verse and then a chorus, just so that instead of being the same melody through each of the five kind of verses, there's a verse and there's a chorus. So straight away, you're gonna be able to um, uh, vary it, and it's gonna keep a listener interested longer. So, there's a great technique that I, again, I've read in uh, David Bowie interviews and kind of people talking about what you have to do is make, if you've got a verse which is very blocky and the words are very ba ba da ba do ba da ba da ba do ba do like very blocky, make your chorus the exact opposite. So your chorus is, well, well, it's long notes and you turn it around. If you've got a verse that's very open, well, my baby has left me. They make your chorus, I'm going to go, I'm going to do, ba do, ba do, ba do, ba do, ba do, ba do. You know, you do it kind of blocky the other way. And that's a, that's a gross oversimplification, of course. But what it does is it separates the two parts. And if you want something that you maybe you want people to sing to, you know, then often a good way is to have few longer notes. That's more kind of anthemic. Mm. Right then. So we've looked at arrangements, we've looked at uh, textures, we've looked at musical stabs and rhythmical ideas. We've looked at, at like trying to come up with like a verse chorus structure. So what you could do, you could, you could, if you were doing this, you know, you could, you could go verse chorus, verse chorus, instrumental, chorus, chorus, finish. You know, that's the way you could say structure this. And this is, of course, is completely down to you. But, um, you know, what I'm hoping is that this just opens the doors. And if you understand the 12 bar, the AAB, and you know what the basic rule is of a blues 12 bar, then you can, you know, once you know what the rules are, of course, you can break the rules. So let's just think a little bit about this idea. If you think about the more 50, the more modern 50s and 60s pop music, and you think about those structures where the bridges, or middle eights as we call them in Britain, or bridges, um, do you know what? Like, um, there are examples of the kind of 20s, 30s, 40s things where the arrangements are odd and they have bridge sections. There's a lot of Jimmy Rogers stuff that has interesting interludes and uh, instrumental sections that have a different chord sequence from the standard verse format. That's a nice way to do it, just so that the chords don't change as you expect them. But one of my favourite examples is there's a Blind Boy Fuller song, which is called Pistol Slapper Blues, which we're going to look at that. It's, it's a different chord um, structure than a typical 12 bar. It's an 8 bar. We'll look at that very shortly. In that song, I've not played it for a long time, but it's kind of... You turn the door, do 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 you turn the in the door. So it's got these verse structures, and then after about three or four verses, he goes, well... I keep in the money, baby, you have to train and go You don't have to tell me you don't want me no more Hey, hey, you don't want me no more He has this thing where he has this chant thing, this breakdown Give me the money, baby, get the train and go You don't have to tell me you don't want me no more Hey, hey, and then he goes to the four chord And it, it's completely at odds with any of the lines in the songs So I think of that as being like a kind of very simplified bridge It doesn't change chords, it doesn't change keys he just has a whole new section and then carries on with the song. And it adds a great kind of like freshness of the song, you know, so it doesn't get too samey. I can't remember when Pistol Slapper was released. I feel like it was around 35, 36, 37, 38, 1938, something like that. You know, it's an example where what we're really looking at is a very simplified bridge idea. And it really does help the song keep its kind of um, interest and drive. <laughs> Okay then, well we're nearly at the end. What I want to share with you now is that, you know what, we've absolutely hammered the standard 12 bar kind of idea. 
What I want to share with you now are some ways that we can change the feel or the chord sequence or the key and it will give you different kind of ideas and different things to work with. So first of all, if we're in E, instead of doing this kind of, you know, I was doing a very basic kind of picking pattern, wasn't I? You know, which wasn't really ever formalised, but you, you get the idea. So, you know, underlying that, there's a kind of... How about going for one of those more kind of Robert Johnson... Um, you know, or later on Stevie Ray Vaughan style kind of shuffle. So we're still in E, but... You know, you, you'll think of songs like Dust My Broom. Uh... So you can still be in a 12 bar, but use that pattern. Now that's what's called a 6-8 rhythm. We don't need to worry about that, but basically it's a called a shuffle pattern. Now, straight away, it's a different kind of um, feel. And, you know, you think of songs like that, you think of Dust My Broom, which again is a song about, I'm going to wake up in the morning, I'm going to dust my broom. So it's basically, I'm going to clean up, I'm going to go. Um, you know, you've been cheating on the woman, uh, you've been cheating on the, maybe another man, so I'm going to go, there's another woman out there, I'm going. It's the sort of, you know, the sort of uh, idea of that song. Well, it's a song about like moving. And it does feel like it's kind of like, it's like a train or kind of something moving, 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 moving. You know, Sweet Home Chicago is another one, I'm going to Sweet Home Chicago. It's it's the same sort of idea. So that's a great idea, you know, straight away there, if you're doing this, you know, it's, a, it's it, your brain should probably go towards like, I'm moving, I'm going, I'm traveling, you know. I'm going, I'm going to go, I'm going to go right now, I'm going to go, go get some fresh coffee. Oh, you get the idea. I'll stop. So while we're in E, um, this is something really, really simple and a great way to do it. Think of John Lee Hooker and or think of um, R.L. Burnside. So those kind of guys do something that has been called only in the last 30 years, um, like Mississippi Hill Country Blues. And it's a weird kind of um, genre title. What it basically means, a lot of those songs have this kind of more like one chord boogie approach. So we're not, So now, for the first time, we're going to change chord sequence. And we're going to change chord sequence by not even playing a chord sequence. We're going to do something which is more kind of like uh, boogie based. <laughs> Got a really simple idea. You just come up, you could come up with any kind of like boogie like. And it's kind of endless, and you know, you want to be listening to, you know, kind of Ariel Burnside or, or John Lee Hooker, but um, you know. Uh, Baby wants to roll. with the lyrics there so the guitar playing was a bit terrible but the, the point what you should hear there is I did an AABA on the, on the kind of um, the melodic sense so the lyrics would do the same um, I stayed on the same chord as a boogie passing something which is worth thinking about you hear a lot in blues music is what I did is I varied the B line melodically so it would be the same lyrics but what you often do is you might go up towards the end of the sorry the, the, the second A line so you do the first A line as per normal you set the scene second A line, you sing with maybe a slight variation, either rhythmically or melodically, you might go up at the end of the line, then what you do is you sing the B line, and that was all over one chord, I and mean, if you come up with a boogie pattern, you know, you'll be able to do that Mississippi Hill Country kind of thing, it's very, very voodoo, very hoodoo, very kind of like, you kind of get a rhythm and you, you know, you set it going kind of thing. So next up is a kind of a, a, a chord sequence variant, which is a kind of what people call an eight bar kind of idea. Um, so it's what you see a lot in like Sister Rosetta Tharp songs, gospel songs, Wreck of the Old 97, which is more of a folk thing, or Careless Love. Um, yeah, so you've got your one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three. Yeah, you do half 
half bar on the bar sub. So, so bar sub you do two bars of E, two bars of B, you do one bar of your E, and then you start again. So in order to vary the sound, like so, so in order to kind of come up with songs and inspiration, you know, um, just straight away we're still in E, but we're using a capo. So when you go to say fret five, you're now technically in the key of A. Well, the guitar sounds higher. You get a different kind of sound. So straight away, you might just find yourself, if you experiment, experiment with a capo, you'll find yourself kind of going... Uh, uh, it's a different sound, and it might lead you to... You know, come up with some sort of different ideas, and that's a nice thing to experiment with. Okay, let's now talk about how actually playing in a different key can help. So, what you find in blues is there are certain kind of keys that suit certain kind of styles of playing. And of course you can do anything if you want, but what I find as an example, E works really well with those very basic blues. That kind of delta or driving thing, very much so. Um, but you know what, if you then think about, you know, I love Blind Boy Fuller. Um, he plays a lot out of G. And as these kind of moves, it's more that kind of Piedmont blues, you know, um, which is the area where where he lived, and it's it's more of a kind of piano-based blues play. Yeah. kind of, you know, that's just a 12 bar in now in the key of G, with a different kind of sense, and that, that kind of works really well, you know, if you think about C, you might think about kind of, you know, like a blind Blake kind of thing, you know, that kind of style, it adds much more of a more ragtime kind of thing. If you're thinking about, say, keys like A, then A is a great guitar key for, for certain kind of moves, you know. Um, I think of Robert Johnson a lot, actually, like, kind of, I don't know, but... Um, so the key of A will instantly give you a new kind of, you know, you learn, maybe you can learn a cover, you know, a Robert Johnson song or something in A. You'll get a lot of ideas from that. You know, A A is very close to. If, if you think about, if you learn, you know, if, if you know about kind of six chords or swing music, then swing is a great kind of feel to write a blues from. With the swing feel, that's a very different kind of feel. All of a sudden, that could you know take you somewhere interesting. So you know what we're looking at uh, different kind of ideas there about your different how different keys affect it, how the capo can help. We've looked at some different chord sequences. I'm going to do one more chord sequence now for you, which is an eight bar blues chord sequence, and then we'll, you know, we'll look at finishing up a bit. So, um, our song, The Sweetest Rose, which is on the, uh, the playlist below, which is the originals playlist. Um, I wrote that kind of based on, uh, there's some Blind William McTell songs that use this chord sequence, and then there's like Key to the Highway by Big Bill Brooms. So what's this eight bar blues? So... <laughs> Uh, oh, Pistol Slapper Blues by Blind Boy Fuller is also this kind of chord sequence. So in this one, you're going to go... Da, 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 da. So you're going from your... In this instance, I'm in, I'm in G, capital 2. I'm just doing it in the sweetest rose key, which is A, technically, because it's G, up, two frets, which is one tone from G to A. But yeah, you've got your kind of one chord, or you know, one, G, to your five, to your four chord, which is in this, this instance is your kind of C. You do two bars on that. So it's one bar on one, one bar on five. Two bars there. One, one. So that's that kind of key to the highway kind of thing, which I love that chord sequence. I could write a million songs in that chord sequence. Um, This is slightly out of tune because of the capoing. I've got a video coming about resonator intonation soon. That'll be fun. So don't forget, after all this, there's loads of uh, other things you can do to kind of uh, uh, invent a wide range of interesting material. Do think about things like tunings, say like 
going from standard to open G or open D, with, especially with a bottleneck, suddenly you get kind of some interesting kind of ideas. So really the last thing, and it's kind of obvious really, but I have sometimes had to explain this to people. But the, the best thing you can do is just to constantly listen and absorb. And I would say to listen to and, and absorb to anything. Um, I find sometimes being like, even, you know, like a kind of high street shop or retailer, and you hear like the modern pop music that I wouldn't normally listen to, the kind of chart music, it's quite inspirational because often um, one of the key things for any kind of writer to keep people interested is about writing hooks. And I can't tell you how many people I've spoken to over the years that don't understand this. You've got to try and write something which is hooky, that is melodic, that's almost annoying. The more kind of inane and annoying it is, and then you dress it up in blues with gruffness and cool old guitars or whatever. Actually, you know what? People respond really strongly to that. So do try and come up with hooks and listen to modern pop music because it's hook loaded almost to too much. But you might find a hook in there that's, that's actually, it, it can inspire you, it can make you think about how to use hooks in a traditional setting and invent something which isn't just a throwback to the olden days, but actually moves it forward. Think about song structures, think about, you know, those 50s, 60s, I was talking about the Beatles, but then listen to bands like, gosh, listen to bands like even, you know, Queen are fascinating because their arrangements are crazy. Once you listen to what a verse is and what chorus is, they're crazy arrangements. I'm not saying you become, you know, the blues, you know, progressive rock yes band or something, but you know what, you know, just um, be open to, to ideas. But listen, and if you're into Roots music, then do listen to, to the new Roots artists, you know, Pokey Lafarge, C.W. Stone King, Luke Windsor, Low King. I mean, they're too many to mention, you know, those. But, you know, do listen to the old guys, do listen to Sunhouse, you know, it will all creep in. And what you'll hear in those lyrics, often, if, you, if you're trying to write lyrics, you will hear the same verses going round and round and round, or variants on them. And then what your kind of job to do is to kind of keep the tradition alive, is to take those, what they call floating verses, and it is to adapt them, change them, um, and reflect your life and the life around you for nowadays times. Um, but perhaps with some of that flavour of the, of the olden days and that drive in the music and that sense of importance and that passion, you know, and I don't think it matters if you're particularly a good guitar player, a good good singer. As long as you're putting across something that's honest, you will connect with people. And I think if you you can put a song across, then um, an audience will respond. And that's what it's all about. And however you do that is entirely up to you. So on that note, this video has been far too long. Thank you for making it this far. And do like and subscribe, drop us a comment. What's your favorite blues song? What, um, do you like writing songs? Have you got any tips to share about writing songs? Please do tell us below because it all helps massively. We'd love to know and we'd love to share it with future people that will find this video and maybe it will help them. So thank you very much, everybody. The band is the Washboard Resonators. My name is Martin. We hope to see you out there. Do join the mailing list. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>